airport in England, General Crerar, Commander-in-Chief, 1st Canadian Army, arrives from Holland. He is in England for a brief period of leave before returning to Canada. After a job well done, the Chief is about to retire from the Canadian Army. His brilliant career is well remembered by all Canadians. In the Italian campaign, where he was GOC 1st Canadian Corps, the lads of 1st and 5th Divisions knew well his qualities of leadership. Leaving Italy for the United Kingdom, he took over command of the 1st Canadian Army as invasion loomed in the west. Moving to Normandy, he led his force on the left of the line through all the decisive battles. Always driving his own jeep, the chief was everywhere in the field. When the historic battleground of Dieppe was captured, he proudly joined his men in the celebration of liberation. In the Reichwald forest, he continuously made first-hand recce's over enemy territory in his own Oster Opit plain. The general led and inspired his command in the great tasks which led to victory. After victory in the West had been won, he called together his troops at Army headquarters to thank them for making it possible. Now the GOC is ready to leave for Canada. From a northern fort, he boards a tender for the Ile de France. In company with a great draft of his men, the Army commander is homeward bound. With General Harry Crerar goes the sincerest wishes for future happiness from all his officers and men of the 1st Canadian Army. In a reversal of customary procedure, the CO, Algonquin Regiment, turns his command over to a Lance Corporal. It's all in fun, however, as the parade marks the regiment's fifth anniversary of mobilization and a ceremonial shaving of all personnel is the feature attraction. On the auspicious occasion, officers and W.O.s who have been growing cookie dusters for six weeks before the anniversary prepare to shed them by numbers. Each year, the lads think up some different idea to celebrate their mobilization. This year, the barbershop derby demustaches everybody from the colonel down. While the band plays the Barber of Seville, the ceremony is conducted with all the military precision of a guard's brigade. The guards are there on the safety razors. Everything from a rose to a Gillette aids in the scraping bee. Although trades pay Group A barber is not granted, there are some likely candidates for number one chair in the local tonsorial parlor for after the war. Under the corporal's watchful eye, every soup strainer is removed from the regiment. With their bare faces hanging out, the officers are in the market for a bottle of hair restorer to replenish their shorn gland. Although no casualties have been reported, a near miss or two just heightens the fun at the Algonquin shaving party. Algonquin Park, Ontario, a beaver resettlement program is operated by Canada's Department of Indian Affairs. In the Provincial Game Preserve, beaver dams are breached in preparation for setting traps to catch the animals alive. Cree Indians from Moose Factory, James Bay, attend to the details of setting a trap. When Mr. Beaver swims into his traveling bag, the catch snaps shut, taking him alive and uninjured. Thirty of Canada's national animals valued at $100 apiece are taken. The next morning, the Indians return to find a live animal in the trap. He is ready to start on his 700-mile journey north to James Bay by rail and canoe. This is the fourth year of the trapping program to restock areas in the north. Arriving from the park at Huntsville Railway Station, the crates of beaver are in train to travel to Moosonee on the first lap of their journey. Their destination is the Cassagamy and Albany River Preserve. Indian men and women handle the last part of the trip by canoe. Albany River, the beaver families are released. 
Finding himself in unfamiliar surroundings, Pot Beaver immediately makes a reconnaissance with a view to building a new home. For five to seven years, he will be safe from trappers while he increases his stock. 4,000 Cree Indians in the James Bay area will benefit from the government's beaver resettlement program. At Appledoorn, Holland, the largest draft of CWACs yet to go to the continent arrives by plane, bringing even their mascots with them. 500 girls arrive to take over the jobs of High Point men to release them for demobilization. Some of them are from CMHQ London, others have just recently arrived from Canada. They are all ready to do a man's job with the Canadian Netherlands forces in the land of the wooden shoes. In a sightseeing trip designed to acclimatize them, a group of CWACs arrive in Volendam. In the quaint old Zyderzee village, the girls find many things to arouse their interest. Talking to natives, window shopping and collecting souvenirs gives them a great opportunity to find out about the land which is to be their temporary home. People in Volendam still wear their traditional Dutch costumes, which are actually ancient religious clothes. The CWACs are so impressed that they hire a few costumes to wear in a trip around the town, wooden shoes and all. After a day of exploration in the tourist paradise, the newly arrived CWACs leave for camp to get on with the job. They are convinced they will enjoy indeed their stay in friendly Holland. Carried by an LCT which saw D-Day service, German amputation cases are transported to Nordany Island, one of the Frisian group. The island is equipped with seven hospitals of the German Army and Navy. Canadian troops supervise the movement of the wreckage of the Wehrmacht. All the German patients are severely wounded cases who will receive advanced treatment from German doctors and nurses. equipped modern hospitals are manned by a German staff. The surgical work, however, is fully supervised by the staff of the DADMS of the 3rd Canadian Division. So the medical work of mercy goes on, regardless of nationality. At a western Canadian port, Rear Admiral Brodeur board ship for a final inspection of one of Canada's newest frigates. The formidable craft, together with sister warships of the cruiser, aircraft carrier and tribal destroyer classes, are ready to join the Allied navies in the Far East. The latest addition to the Canadian Navy steams to sea for her trial run. Action stations. With an enemy in sight, the great vessel unlimbers her full armament. With clockwork precision, each man takes up his station ready for battle. veteran crews and equipped with the latest in guns and gear, the Canadian frigate is ready for anything under the rising sun. Depth charges are prepared against a submarine. With an 
unenviable record in Atlantic warfare, the Royal Canadian Navy will be in at the kill when the blow-off comes in Tokyo.